from left to first you need to So I maybe who's who's first? Good. Is there a list of all the chemicals they use for the fracking available to the public? Because I've heard it's something like 500, and there was a real problem with the, the uh, companies not wanting to divulge that. And there's, no way to, no way to there's only that I that I know of. There's only two states that require disclosure, and that's Wyoming and Texas, and they typically can get waivers from disclosure in Texas if they say that it's confidential or proprietary. So the short answer is is that <clears throat> we have some idea of, you know, maybe 50 chemicals that are used, but uh, just by uh, forensics, nothing else. Uh, but no, there's no, there is no requirement. And the, the, as proposed, the, uh, you're not, dis you, you would not be required to disclose chemicals in New York State if you claim that it was to be even more precise, you would have to disclose them to the DEC, but they wouldn't, they would, it would be confidential, it wouldn't be made available to the public. So the long answer is that no, you really wouldn't know. I'll tell you this though, I mean, they've tried every nasty thing you can think of, I mean, including just putting diesel fuel in to slick in the water, which is co a very common practice, number two. And drilling, they used to, um, to cool, keep the drill bit cool, they would used to put powdered asbestos. They would mix it in with the um, drilling mud up until the 80s, I guess. Just, I mean, dumping sacks of powdered asbestos into the hopper. So, you know, it, and, and, you know, they talk about green drilling fluid and all that's baloney, you know. The problem is, is, is that it's not just the drilling fluid, although that can be a obvious problem. The problem is, is that once the, as we went through that drilling log real quickly, the way that you find shale on a drilling log is a gamma ray log, it's like a Geiger counter, and the shale is the most, or carbon rich shale is the most radioactive sedimentary layer that, the, that you're going to encounter. So you're basically, if you, you know, you're basically looking for high radioactivity. Um, and so, point being is, is it isn't just like you know what you put down there it's what you get back up from the from the formation and as Kelly mentioned that includes arsenic and radium 226 and, and things that are as toxic or more toxic po possibly or carcinogenic than the drilling fluid and those are naturally occurring you know in the shale formation so it's like you get back part of the drilling fluid in the flow back, plus all this other stuff that you harvested. Is that the correct term? <laughs> harvested radium. Can I ask a follow up to that actually? On, on frackfocus.org, what yeah. are they giving you as the data? They list yeah. chemicals. What are they? Frack focus is a really, it's an interesting kind of a ploy. Frack focus is a, a is an industry crafted best practice protocol where you're where you're supposed to the drillers are supposed to report to the frac focus organization for which again remind you mind you is an industry you know uh, funded or whatever group what you're using what's what's um, the problem is 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 that was that they're not all members all the drillers are not members of frac focus. Some of the biggest drillers are not members of Frack Focus, and they don't tell Frack Focus everything <laughs> that they're doing. So what? But what's happened is, is that <laughs> the Frack Focus, the industry, just you know, forget calling it Frack Focus, just calling it the, the industry. <laughs> yeah, the frackers have gotten in, have gotten state regulators to accept in, in Pennsylvania and some western states. They've gotten the, the state regulators to accept Frack Focus as a ploy, as a quote industry best practice ploy to subvert or circumvent having a regulation right. that, that, they, you know, that, the, that the government would enforce as to what was in a, a, a frack, what was in the frack fluid. And, so, and because it's so, it's, it is in fact a cop out. In fact, whenever you, in the DEC regs or any of these regs, whenever they were, whenever regulator refers to best practices, it's a cop out because obviously a best practice it's just, it's just, you know, good intentions 
uh, and it's not, it, it has no it doesn't have the force of law. And yet, the industry promotes uh, best practices as a way basically to avoid regulation. And Kelly, you had a follow up? One thing I wanted to bring up, Dr. Ron Bishop, who is a professor in chemistry at SUNY Oneana, one of the things that he has been concerned about is not only the chemicals that they use, but what chemicals are created, A, from when these things mix in the ground, in the recycling of frac fluids, in the impoundment ponds, when they're putting all this stuff together. So the unknown quantity is what might we be creating by mixing unknown chemicals together and now we have more unknown chemicals which makes it really difficult when you're talking about testing to know what to test for and then the other issue with the chemicals that we didn't touch a lot about is how do you get rid of this stuff and that is the big question mark you know they tried dumping it in the waters in Pennsylvania that didn't work out so well and a study that was just done is showing residual radioactivity in the streams from them dumping this stuff in the injection wells, we, they're using them in Ohio. Right now there's a big push in Ohio to get rid of the injection wells because <coughs> the earthquakes that are happening and when the injection wells all start to fail because it's the same as a drilling well except now we're just shoving all the stuff down in, is that going to start migrating? Is that going to start contaminating people's water? You know, one of the things you hear all the time is, you know, we have this protective casing room and we're a mile down, we have all this rock over the top of it. Well, when you're sticking a bunch of straws into this rock, and these straws are all going to decay, how does that protective layer of rock help any of us when that stuff wants to go somewhere? So years down the road, we're going to have a big surprise. <coughs> Um, I was just wondering, and this is probably this is really kind of a complicated question. Um, you mentioned all future project. Okay, you mentioned all of these different um, reasons why there isn't gas, or there, there is not gas. How much do you think, like the the waste industry, like Casella Industries, and that are gathering all this waste into New York State, and and the water industry, and the you know, the chemical industry, the sand industry, how much are they playing to create this false need? How much are the road, um, you know, the road industry, uh, Peckham Industries that make asphalt, yeah. how much do they want to have this going and they keep on perpetuating it? Right, well, I mean, well, that's a good, that's a good question. You know, we didn't get into why, <clears throat> in, in any detail, why, why this has been hyped, but obviously that's why it's been hyped. It's because anybody, uh, in the, you know the gravel business or whatever, the waste hauling that wants to cash in on this has been hyping this. Has been hyping the the benefits of it, and of course, and all the benefits are tied to the fact that there would be a lot of producing wells here. So uh, they, I mean, it, oddly enough, some a lot of the people that are hyping it, I guess, naively don't really understand what they're saying. I mean, in other words, they're they bought into the early uh, argument about how prolific it would be in New York, and they don't. Nobody's told them otherwise. And even if somebody like Lou Allstadt or I told them, they wouldn't believe us anyway. But they wouldn't want to believe it. But there. But the pro the problem is here in this county. Is is it you know, the the upside if you can call it that, of gas drilling is very limited. Maybe just to the extreme southeast. Uh, or southwest corner of the county, if that. But the the downside of it is just, it could be considerable. Because, I mean, it would literally become a place for um, for people to dump frack waste. Uh, they're, they're just, they're just they're, they're, they don't have enough places to get rid of this stuff. Kelly mentioned disposal wells. In most western states, the way they get rid of the frack waste is they just take it and they inject it down into a deep disposal well. And of course, as we've learned, <coughs> the problem is, is if you do that enough, that it will precipitate uh, earthquakes. Uh, and so they've had earthquakes in parts of Texas that there have never been earthquakes in recorded history, at least of that magnitude. So it's not exactly a good solution. They don't have, uh, they don't have places to get rid of. Uh, there, actually, there's eight injection wells or disposal wells that are 
permitted in New York State, but none of them take frac waste. And uh, there are probably no good uh, geological formation to inject uh, frac waste in New York State. Uh, so there won't even, there, by a geological standpoint, there won't even be any uh, disposal wells in New York State. There are hardly any in Pennsylvania. Kelly mentioned there's uh, about 100 or some odd in Ohio that are causing problems. But the point of it is this, is, is that they've, you've got all, the, even in Pennsylvania or what happens south there in Delaware County or Broome County, they're going to have to get rid of this frac waste somewhere. The drill cuttings come back radioactive because the, think about it, the sh the, when the drill bit goes down and goes horizontally through the shale, then it's literally got the drill bit is going literally through the, the, the most radioactive part of the earth. Um, so it's in effect when it pulls those, those drill cuttings back out of that horizontal, it's basically pulling out radioactive rock. Uh, it's mining radium, you know. Uh, and um, they got to get rid of that stuff. They got to get rid of the frac water that comes back <coughs> from the frac. Uh, and they can't inject it into the ground, which is the solution out west. They can't make it disappear. <laughs> quote unquote for 20 years or so <laughs> and back into the ground so they have to come up with these you know euphemisms about uh, DI spreading on the road is de-icer because it's so briny it's you know it's an ancient sea so it's salty so it's the so now all of a sudden it's a de-icer you know or it's it's a dust suppressant on the seasonal roads I mean the thing the thing that gets me is is it would you it's just it's just illegal in Texas. I mean, that, after they stop laughing, they throw you in jail. I mean, you know, because you just can't do that. There's no, in the D.C., you can get a permit to do that in this state, to spread it on a road. You, you just can't, in New Mexico, you just can't do it. You know, it's just, no. Nobody in their right mind would believe that it makes any sense to year after year to spread radium onto a county road. Not a good idea. Not unless you want to see the daisies glow. <laughs> we have a question out here. So I, I have a question. Which I unfortunately came in late, so I didn't get to hear the beginning of your presentation. But if it wasn't there, much. <laughs> you didn't miss anything. But the question I have is, if there is this hype about gas production possibilities yeah. and there isn't really the gas possibilities, yeah. why are the gas companies pushing it? Good what question. Uh, good, very good question. That, well, the short answer is is what they are, what is being pushed is the rhetoric. <laughs> I mean, what you're seeing is, and the reason why I think they continue to push it is they've kind of gotten themselves out on a limb, but this is a, believe it or not, New York State is a really big media market. And so this has become a big political media PR uh, effort that's way outside, uh, way out of proportion to what the actual uh, prospects are in the state. That's, that's the first point. The second point is, is that, it, and you were here, I think you got here at halftime, is, is that when you look at what they've actually filed for drilling permits, you know, you have this huge area that they say, you know, is going to be yield. Saudi Arabia you know, with trees <laughs> is, is that um, is, is when you look at what they're actually doing other than the rhetoric and the lobbyists and all in Albany which has political and media ramifications but when you look at what they're actually permitting to drill wells uh, Exxon is only has one permit filed it's not like they couldn't afford to have more permits in the queue they've gone from five to one you know uh, Chesapeake's gone from like 32 down to 12. When it really comes to like, where do they really think they're going to do this? You know, show us the show us the dr the drill rig. <laughs> so then, 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 it, it, then that's all that's all that it, that it boils down to. The rest of that. So what I'm saying is, is when you go beyond what they have as permits in the queue, the rest of all this is hyperbole, <coughs> is PR. You know, and the, and when you think about it, I don't belabor this. You know. Is, is that you, when you think about the number of crews and the number of rigs it would take to drill 12 wells, I mean, come on. What about I mean, the you know, of you could do that, you know, you could do that with two rigs. So, sh so should we be less worried? Well, here in your, I mean, yeah, they said, I, God, 
What is, well, why didn't I think of that? Scheme. Yeah, actually, the short answer to that is yes and no. And let me tell you, <laughs> no, really, the short answer is is that you know, depending on where you live, it, the yeah, yeah, yes, you should be you should be less worried about some you know guy that talks like me and coming and like ruining your neighborhood. Uh -huh. That's for sure. And and when we 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 first started talking about this, uh, I've only made this presentation once before at SUNY. Is is it was it one guy that I knew was like he said I have been worrying about this for five years, and based on what you do, I have finally stopped worrying. It's like whoa, dude, you know, like you know, don't be so hasty. <laughs> and it's because the reason why you can't be too hasty is because you still have to get rid of all this stuff. Yeah. Well, what I'm really telling you here is is that there is no upside. There's no jobs. There's no tax here. You know, and th right here we are, and probably in this county. But there is, is you still have the risk of, the, of these of these well, these wastewater trucks and stuff coming in and dumping this stuff on your roads. It's like it, that's really when you think of it in that terms. It's like, ooh, that's not so good. We have nothing but downside. You know, it's been the fractivists, if you pardon the expression, have been saying this for some. But now it's really true. There is no upside. You know, and if somebody some some lobbyist comes in, show me the geology. You know, it's, oh, you're lying. Show me the geology. Show me the drill logs. Tell me all about it. Where is it? You know, that's, that's what we hope to do after this thing in Cornell's. We hope for them to come back to, and then we just say, okay, tell me all about it. Where's the gas? You know, these are the permits. Where's the rest of them? Yes, ma'am. Where are Michael? these permits that have been granted in? Where are the what? These permits that have been given to these companies. Yeah, there haven't been any. Let me be clear. The what? I, the permits that I showed on the screen were the were the were the horizontal hydrofrac well permits in the queue at the DEC. They have not been granted. They're just applications. Right, and what? The, they, they, have, they have filed these applications for yeah. which areas? Oh, the ones I showed on the map. They're in all in Broome oh. County. Delaware County, and I think maybe green? no. There are no, there are no horizontal hydrofrac well permits in Green County. She had a question next. Yeah, I just had a question because I've noticed on television for the past couple of months this Energy.org commercial oh, yeah. saying how wonderful it is, and I yeah. recognize the actress used to be is a model. It? Yeah, that's um, Brooke, Al so that's Brooke like Alexander. Alexander. Yeah, and it looks because it's a dot org. It looks like it's a nonprofit organization, oh, yeah. which I'm sure it is to get right. a dot org. But isn't it run by the oil and gas industry? Yeah, well, there's a yeah. Actually, a lot most of these kind of front groups, uh, they have these great names like you know Americans for Prosperity and you know Freedom <laughs> and whatnot. Uh, like they're all. They all. They all have. They all. And if you trace it back down, and my fellow blogger uh, Dory Pipoff does this regularly, if you cut through all the layers, they all go back to some K Street lobbyists in Washington D.C. Yes. And they're all front groups, and they actually clone them from one state to the next. And what is it? The energy. The Empire Energy yeah. Forum. The one here. The one of them in New York State that's basically owned by the Koch brothers, or is it Koch? I can't remember. Um, is a it's a it's a clone of one that they have in Kansas and in Texas. Ohio. Yeah, they just yeah. come up with a different name, like the Buckeye Energy yeah. Forum in this state is the Embry, and they and then they hire some local people or or on their board. Uh, you know, it's but it's all a front. It's all a front. And the reason why the front aspect, the PR aspect, is so out of proportion to the actual. Uh, potential here in New York State is again is because it's such a big media market, and because they've gotten Cuomo, you know, you in this position, uh, that it, they can't back off, and they and they certainly could never. Uh, uh, you would never get an interested geologist to you know openly and publicly concur with what I just showed you tonight. <laughs> Larry, was next. Larry, yes. not that I. I have hope that the health department will be our, our uh, savior in this, but where, do we know where the Department of Health is on their ruling or on, on their um, review, <coughs> review of the health issues? One of the big, they were supposed to look at these big studies that were going to happen in Pennsylvania. 
uh, Guthrie and Geisinger were supposed to get together in this multi-million dollar health study. Problem is the funds never materialized, so that study isn't happening. Um, David Carpenter and some other folks have been going out into the rural areas doing their own you know, beginning impact studies of what kinds of health impacts are they seeing, what could it be attributed to. Um, so those are very preliminary. Now the problem with the Department of Health study is they hired three experts. They put gag orders on them and they paid them for a limited amount of time. So in the health community, we do not know what they're looking at, what they were charged with looking at. Um, there was a rumor that they were charged at looking at what's worse, coal or gas, which has nothing to do with the discussion we're having right now. Um, the Department of Health was, they, uh, was foiled to try to get the information. They refused, so they're being sued now by a group. Said, you know, we need to know what you're looking at. We have experts in our own state in environmental health, in medicine, pediatrics, you know, who are incredible resources on this. You know, and there, it's funny because you look at the industry, whenever anyone credible comes out with a concern, they're pretty much blackballed as being this anti gas, anti money making loon. Why would anyone in the health profession, you know, I'm going to go after the gas companies just because I don't want them to make money. Health professionals look after our health, and that's what the Department of Health should be doing. Their job is to protect us, to make sure that we stay healthy. We've had enough contamination in this state as it is that we're still cleaning up. You know, and there's so many things we don't know the impacts of, because as I said before, the technology of this industry it is way out here, and what we know scientifically about the impacts, you know, we're, we're way at the bottom of the spectrum. So this Department of Health study that Cuomo said, oh, it's going along fine, going where we want it to. Why all the secrecy? This is something that the public needs to know, and our researchers and our health professionals need to know. We need to know what they're looking at. We need to know what the data sets are. You know, is it as with the S guys? Are they just going to the industry and saying, okay, so what are the problems? Uh, what do we, it, which is what happened with the S guys. Basically, they let the industry write this thing. You know, so when we all commented on it, with the aid of our experts, you know, to find out why it was so worthless, and they're doing the same thing with the uh, LPG regulations that they're trying to come out with. They went to the industry and said, okay, so what do you want us to write, basically? And those regulations are laughable because there's nothing in them. But same thing with the Department of Health. Their charge is supposed to be to protect us, but we don't know what they're doing. And Cuomo has pretty much put a gag on everybody. Yeah. John was next. And then Mary. And then, Linda. And then I think it was yeah, Joanne. Linda. Oh, I'm sorry, Linda. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Chip, to get back to the implications of the geology production value mm -hmm. for New York, or for us, mm -hmm. um, is it possible that because each the, there are not gushers, mm -hmm. that they will keep drilling more, there might be more, I remember reading this, actually it was Deborah Rogers or somebody, but I won't, I won't, I won't, I'm not sure it's her, that, yeah. they, that they'll keep, you know, they'll keep drilling, Right. These test wells and these test fracks, which are going to be just as bad for us, even though. Well, yeah, well, I think what you're, yeah, what you're referring to with De Deborah Rogers is, is that in order to maintain the overall productivity of the field, <clears throat> it, it, the, it, the wells, the production declines so quickly they have to constantly keep drilling more wells to keep the overall pro production lift. So it's like. Lou Allstadt said it's sort of like running up a uh, down escalator. You know, you just, it's, it's a tough assignment. But no, the, the, the really, what would happen here though, that's probably, that's kind of what's happening in Pennsylvania and May and Barnett, Shale in Texas. What would happen, what's more than likely to happen here is, is, is that um, you'll get the, basically the worst case scenario wells, which means they will be wildcat exploration wells and uh, prospecting for gas to, to see what the limits are. And, but they will have almost as many trucks and almost as much potential for pollution as if they were productive. <laughs> so, and if they're not productive, if they aren't hooked up and if they aren't producing, 
they don't even go on to the local ad valorem tax basis. They're not even, they're literally not even taxed. It's a tremendous investment, but it pays no uh, property tax. They pay, obviously they pay no production tax because there is none in, t in, in New York, but you've got the roads been torn up. So it's sort of like, you know, it's, for a, for a large area of New York that would be subject to prospecting, it's like the worst case scenario because there is no upside, even in theory, uh, if they're dry holes. And like we showed on those graphs, these, in most of these areas, they're likely to be dry holes. But ironically, as long as they can get the money from Wall Street or from Norway or Toronto, Canada, they will continue to. And so when the, you know, if hydrofacker, if horizontal wells are permitted in the state, they'll be in here, but the drilling wildcats. You know. So th I'd say the yes and no, whether we should be still worried, the yes has yeah, the, to be given uh, some Well, the, 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 the no is you shouldn't be worried because it, it's probably not going to be productive. But the yes is, is that you're going you're gonna to have wildcat drills in here. And, you're, and there's nothing to stop people from coming here and dumping frack waste. Yeah. If you know, again, if you don't have a road use permit, if you don't have a county, we got Linda and then Mary. Do you want to go, Linda? No, no. Linda and then Joanne. Um, I have then, about three oh, three parts to this. Um, uh, are subsidies involved in any of this? I, I know that to make it feasible or profitable to continue doing. If do you want to do this one at a time? Uh, all right. Because my memory is shot. <laughs> the Actually, you know, if people talk about how oil and gas is, you know, silently subsidized and it's a covert and it's a conspiracy. And people are right. <laughs> because it, what it is, but it is not like, it's not like, it's not like a, a direct tax subsidy for lot is covert or to overt is a, you know, solar wind farm. But it's more covert. I mean, you know, the the depletion allowance and and in accounting, there's things that, that the oil and, there are benefits of the oil and gas industry have in the tax code that are you know tantamount to subsidies. So that's a sh that's a kind of the long answer. Um, the other curious thing, and you didn't ask this, but I'll I'll answer it anyway. Is, is that all of this was paid for by the, you know, the development of this technology was paid for by the federal government, by the United States taxpayer back in the 70s. The whole, the hydro, horizontal hydrofracking of tight sands was an energy research and development in this, in a, in a, energy research and development in a r and uh, project back in the 70s with like no strings attached and Hal Burton you know, was a contractor. And they developed, the feds paid for, the predecessor of the DOE paid for the development of this technology. And Halliburton got it passed. And Halliburton, yeah, and what's interesting is, is that there was so, I say no things attached, because even though the, 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 it was done under IRTA and then a DOE grant, is there were no, there were no, that IRTA and DOE didn't end up with a patent on hydrofracking. Halliburton did, or at least the tech, technique. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's a two-part question, and Kelly probably want to get into this too. If uh, it could be that we, this has been a major diversion for all of us. That all we're worrying about is drilling in the state. And uh, meanwhile, while they're they put in place and been planning for a decade or more, uh, salt cavern storage of LNG. All of the pipelines, the compressors, I don't know if you all are you're probably as aware as I am that they, you have to have a compressor every 30 to 70 miles, depending upon topography, with hilly or not hilly. So uh, whether it's a diversion or not, and really this is what they, want, they wanted us to spend our time doing while all this other stuff is happening to get it to Boston, to New York, and to China, and wherever, to Europe, wherever. Um, what can we do besides, obviously, in, uh, in this county, uh, uh, ban waste ban uh, banning of gas, uh, gas frack waste, uh, heavy industry, a full, full ban, although Chip's information makes it sound like it's not necessary unless uh, an actual heavy industry ban would ban 
compressor stations, pipelines, or any of the other ancillary poison in this industry. You just said that the mm -hmm. No, but I'm just what one it, it's a difficult issue. When we talk about pipelines, for example, some pipelines are federal, federally regulated through FERC. I mean, they can approve pipelines if they're considered, you know, a, a trans-state issue. You know, right now with the Constitution pipeline coming out of Pennsylvania into New York, there's a huge battle with people in Otsego, Delaware, um, Scarry County to stop this pipeline. But there are other pipelines, Spectre Pipeline, there's another pipeline heading up towards Syracuse. I mean, they have all these pipelines everywhere. Some are probably heading up toward the tar sands because they need methane gas to work the tar sands. Some are heading off for export. Um, but you're absolutely right. It, you know, we talk about the fracking. That's only one small issue. We have got to look at the compressor stations, the pipelines, the LNG storage. It's all of this hitting everybody at once, and it can be overwhelming. Um, there is a meeting, the DEC is holding hearings right now on this compressed natural gas station siting nonsense. They're having something in Albany, and Mary can get the details on that. So we're kind of fighting this on all fronts, and we've been very, very fortunate that we have groups that have taken this on. We have a fantastic group right now fighting the Constitution Pipeline. They're educating landowners on their rights about eminent domain, about survey crews, you know, what their rights are, because they're being bullied. You know, people are saying, you can't stop us, we can come on your land, we can do anything, we're gonna give you all this money. Yeah, so they're working on that. A huge group in Seneca working on energy with the salt cavern storage. Um, different groups into the mini sink with the compressor station down there. And the problem with the compressor stations, as we've seen in PA, <coughs> they aren't looking at the whole gamut of compressor stations. They look at a compressor station. What are the, what is the pollution coming out of that compressor station? What they don't consider is when you start throwing in many compressor stations and they're all spewing pollution out, what are the impacts? So that's been one of the big problems in PA right now. You know, they're looking at everything as separate little things and not <coughs> cumulative impacts. You know, so, and as for when you talk about a town ban, does a town need it? Yes. You need to stand up. Not only does it protect your town, because as, you know, we were saying, with the exploration, if you don't have a ban, any Yahoo can come in and, and do exploration. Right now in PA, they're doing... Uh, shallow fracking exploration. You know, oh, we can go in, we don't have to go way deep, uh, less money for the mom and pop operations, we can do shallow fracking. And it, so you need protection for your town. So protect your town, protect against solution mining, protect against everything that you can protect against, road preservation, um, injection wells. And then you need to get on board with the fighting of the pipelines <coughs> and with the compressor stations and LNG, because that will affect all of us. Can, the, uh, can a town uh, zoning ordinance protect, stop a PSC OK compressor station? So that's the problem with Minisync, with FERC. Because no, FERC. But if, if it's a state license thing? It, it, it yeah. differs. Can home yeah. rule supersede a state license? Yeah, so it depends on what's coming in and yeah. what you can zone out. Can you zone out <laughs> gathering lines? Yeah, I mean, because there are no regulations on them. You know, and I would absolutely tap Mary on those issues because she has done a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> I've tapped Mary. Mary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's tapped me. And, I, and I've tapped, I tell you. <laughs> no, but it's very important. You know, and I will, I'll be the first one to admit, when it comes to a lot of that, I've been very involved in, in the town level impacts and what towns can do and, and, and basically mobilizing your town to protect yourselves and what you have to do as an individual to protect yourself. And as I said, we're so fortunate to have people who are taking these other issues on because one person, there's no way you can do it all. You know, but, but support the people that are doing this as best you can because it's important to all of us. If I, let me, let me, if you, if the first thing is you have to get control of the county or the town board to do, I mean, to do anything of, of this nature. That the I would agree with uh, Kelly that it's uh, even though it's unlikely that this is going to be, you know, the new Saudi Arabia, whatever. It, it's probably wise to go to have a ban 
because the reason why, again, is because it would protect the town. It, a moratorium or a ban uh, from wildcat wells. And, but the other things that are equally important is you, is you have to have a road ordinance uh, so that, so that um, uh, trucks don't come through here and tear the roads up and not pay for it. And some of the, some of the um, you, and you basically, the county or the town has got to ban frack waste on roads. I mean, just as a, there's no upside in that. And if they can, they have to ban if in municipal uh, landfills, or they got to ban uh, drill, taking drill cuttings. Because, you know, there's just no telling what's in those trucks or what's in those, it's not like they're going to wave a Geiger counter over every load. So you, it's just the smart thing to do would be to ban those things. Those are things that, that are very highly probable could happen in this county, this town, risks, and that you could control. Now you ask about a compression station. If it's a FERC regulated compression station, that's the problem with it, or FERC regulated, there's nothing you can do no, about it. No, I know that. And uh, maybe, depending, uh, a state regulated may or may not be able to block it or stop it. Home rule may or may not. That's yeah, the, it, it's, then it becomes pretty iffy. But um, yeah, I would focus on the things you know you can get done. Joan first. Joan, no, no, okay, uh, we had Joanne and then you, Joanne? Yeah, um, and then back I'm blown away by what you're saying. <laughs> because I've been doing this for seven years too. I, are you aware that they plan on building a building um, thousand megawatt gas fired power plants? Am I aware of it? Yes. Here? Where? Where? Here in New York. Well, yeah, There's they one do it. In Athens is working. Yeah, they do it all the time. They one in CPV um, connected with um, where we wound up down yeah. in um, Orange County, right. in the Cricket Valley in Dover Plains in Dutchess County to start breaking ground maybe as early as next year. Yeah. Where the hell then is the gas going to come from to power these plants? Well, they're probably sitting right on top of an existing power, I mean a transmission line, gas line, or there's... Uh, a what? They're probably near, a they're, if they're going to build a plant, they'd be a tr near a transmi uh, gas transmission line. A, a pipeline? Yeah, pipeline. Not, not electric yet? No. So, but I mean, that's kind of not, I don't, I really don't do power plants. Uh, I really don't know. Oh, you know, well, there's serious about discussion that. that they will replace Indian Point with those three power plants. I don't, I'm sorry, I can't answer the question. I don't know. I, th what, I think the one thing, without talking about specific power plants, the thing to be aware of is there's a big push by the industry to increase the need for consumption of methane gas. They want to convert power plants, they want to convert our homes, our schools, our cars, because once the demand is there, then that gives them yet another excuse to continue fracking. The other thing it does is builds a huge demand on a limited supply of gas. So people think they're getting cheap gas now, you need to be really aware of the fact that that gas isn't going to stay cheap especially once they start exporting it. The other issue to look at is way back before all this started, there was a big battle between the natural gas industry and the coal industry. Natural gas trying to paint coal as being bad so that they could push natural gas. Now there's a price point breakage between where natural gas is cost effective versus coal. So if gas gets too expensive, then coal is back in the mix again. So we're right back where we started from. You know, so it, there's a lot more in play in this. You know, so building up that demand is, is not a good thing. And they really don't want renewables because then we don't need either one of them. <laughs> we had so, up front and then back there. Well, I had just, in a way, my question was answered, but it might not be bad to kind of sort of do bullet points uh, as to what we can do actually to prevent them from dumping and from, uh, cat, what did you call it, when they do the wells that aren't really going to produce it? Wow, yeah. Um, like, what are the actual steps we can take, and to whom do we speak to make sure that we're protected against this? But do, first you look, does your town have a comprehensive, does it have a master plan? Does it have a comprehensive plan? Do you have zoning ordinances already? Um, some towns that we've been to, they don't even have a master plan because your zoning builds off your master plan. So in conjunction 
you go to your town board and the planning board helps to craft your master plan and from the master plan are then crafted your zoning regulations or your zoning laws. Um, and that's why it's important if you have none of that, you need a moratorium because you need time to do this. You need that breathing space to get all this done because it's not something that can happen overnight. You need public hearings, you need input, you need to read everything over. Um, there, you know, have, make sure you have a good town attorney that can help you craft the language. And if you look at other towns, whether it be Middlefield or any other place, a town about Seagull, places that have bans, look at the language that they have written in their laws, see how it applies to your town. So if you don't have those, definitely need a moratorium. And then once those are in place, then you can institute your ban. Um, so the first place to start, it build up that support in your community. You need people, our, our town board had never had so many people coming. It is pretty much it was routine stuff, all of us passed the dog lawn. And we made sure we were always there and we were listening because the industry was there you know, when they were trying to do this. So we needed to know what was happening. So we were at every meeting and we asked questions and we did our own research. And we support, we had a couple of guys on our town board that had old leases at like two or three dollars a year per acre or something from way back. And they would have been integrated into this. And these guys listened to us and it was important for them, they've lived there their whole lives, to protect the town. You know, so it was really a joint effort. And we were very lucky that we didn't have a town board made up of, of pro-gas uh, interests that were thinking, I'm gonna be a millionaire. I don't care what you people want, I want my money. And we're seeing that in a lot of these other counties, Shenango, Delaware, places where they think they're gonna get rich. You know, so basically start at the ground level and there are resources to help. And you know, I'd be happy, you know, you know Get a hold of Mary, she'd give me my information, she'd be happy to help on the Thank you. Okay. But let me add to that in, in Greene County, to my knowledge, most towns don't even have uh, comprehensive plans, and very few. Uh, yeah, Catskill does. does. I know, I, and I, I live yeah. in Catskill, lived in Catskill, I know that we did, but very few have taken that step or even have comp, you know, zoning that's that, that's effective too. So she's absolutely right. And it, it's it's a great idea if even if all you want to make sure is that a meat packing plant doesn't go next to your uh, you know your neighbor house. Ed. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry I got here late, and um, my understanding is that um, from what I did see that the uh, uh, economic viability of extracting gas based on the current price, I believe you said was. 450 per million cubic feet. Yeah, the uh, that's the break. That is the theoretical break even. But there, we know they're building LNG terminals all over the place, and uh, that the, the price of gas is five to ten times higher in Asia and Europe. And in fact, there's going to be a, a rally in Albany on the 30th and a hearing about that, which everybody should try to get to. Um, my question is: Is there really just plain no gas? Or are they letting us have our moratorium and letting Cuomo not decide and eventually it's going to reach where they can export enough of it to where it becomes worth 10, 12, 15 bucks. Yeah. And then, hey, there is enough gas in Green or Ulster. Right. Or, is, or is it just plain no gas there? And I'm sorry I was late. No, no, no. That's a, gr that's a great question because all of that that I presented was premised on you know the price of gas, the economics of the wealth. The, the catch is though is is it is it, so what it, what that that shows is in effect is where the say the current uh, economic line would be if you will vis-a-vis -vis the depth and the whatnot. The interesting thing is though is is that the shale becomes uh, shallower so quickly and it, the depth uh, it becomes uh, thinner so quickly that the that the limit between where it is economically viable. And the north, say, call it the northern limit boundary of where it's just forget about it. It's not that far. And if, in other words, if you said, in other words, if we change the graph and we said, okay, pretend like it's twelve dollars in MCF, or it's you know, probably maybe, almost maybe four times the current price, it wouldn't extend. It probably wouldn't extend this far north. Is what is the short answer, meaning that and the re, and what the boundary uh, the the acid test is 
and I can say that, you know, with some authority because I'm of a certain age, uh, is, is that the, um, is, is that it becomes the, it becomes literally the energy return on investment, meaning at some point it costs more, it, it costs more energy to put into the drilling, fracking the well than the amount of energy that you get out. And obviously, irrespective of the dollar amount of the commodity, at that point, it does, it's not worth doing. It is, and, and so, in other words, the energy return of an investment threshold would be probably somewhere south of here. You know, I hate to be so, but that's so unscientific about it. That's, but that's a fact. Right, the higher the cost get also, the, the higher the cost to extract it because of the Yeah, energy. right, yeah. And so it's, so the ERA, you know, boundary line is probably south of here somewhere. And not a whole lot further north than those, you know, the lines that I was showing on the on the map. We're south of here. Yeah, really. I had to pull the map back up. Exactly, we're south of here. Trent, uh, gentlemen in the back, please. And I'm trying to tell you that there are two rather significant projects which are not necessarily reflecting the concerns of fracking, but I think are important. The question I wanted to ask is related to all of them. The two projects, one is a transmission line gas at 660 per square inch in Athens. The other one is a horizontal drilling project that will take direct current from Athens to New York City at Indian Point. It's one of four that a company called Power Bridge has sponsored. My question is related to those, but will have some bearing. I asked the representative from Power Bridge if the funds that were set aside for studies could be used by the community. And the answer to that I know is yes. He said he didn't know. But my question is, anybody ever tapped into those funds, not for the study of the environment, but to hire professionals that, so we could use their money find out the kind of information you're asking about for baseline, and for monitoring, and for us in Athens on the initial stage, to hire professional negotiators who really know the industry. And I don't know if anybody in your institute, in your experience, because it sounds extensive if you work on it, has anybody ever tried to use the industry money against it? The folks on the Constitution are not taking industry money. They're raising their own funds to hire their own experts to counteract what Williams is saying in relation to the pipeline. Um, a BOCES in Schoharie County was offered something like twenty-five or thirty-five thousand dollars a bribe to let the pipeline go through the property. BOCES turned it down because they teach students construction trades, bulldozers. Uh, Oh, okay, <laughs> so they basically said, no, we don't want your money, we don't want your pipeline. Our student safety and their education comes first. You know, so, you know, short answer is I, I don't know the answer to that question, but that with the people that are working on these issues, you know, the industry is great at bribing, you know, oh, we'll give money to you, we'll give money to you, and, and basically then it looks like they have buy-in on this pipeline. So the whole point of the people working against the Constitution is to go to these folks saying, if you take their money, then they are using that as support you know, for them to go yeah, forward. A very quick follow-up. The theory is, if that money is there to be used for research, and if the community is entitled to use it, and I think, I'm sure they are, you have you like tried this. to extract the money and then go find your independent experts or negotiators? That's really the that's a good question and the I guess looking at it would be is does the money come without strings right. or do they then own the research that they've given you the money for right. I think it definitely would be worth looking into to see I, I don't know the answer to that but I know that with article 10 for power plants that money is to the town and other municipalities right. but I don't know the answer to your question because I didn't know there was a, a pot of money for that as well hmm. so that's exactly the question I think well, if it's Article 10, then the answer is the town is the answer. Yes, we ought to be asking, because if that money can come to hire independent experts, and I think equally important independent negotiators, and these guys are making work. Article Power Bridge is owned by 13 people. They just completed a project for $660 million. 
So if you're going to go up against that kind of talent and that kind of money, you have to find another way to fight it. I think it's to use that money for independent people who understand this. Okay, I'll shut up. Article, Article 10 money has been slightly tested in what it can actually pay for or not pay for. I don't recall if it was by a court. I spoke to a lawyer about it, and it's limited in what it can be used for. But again, that, that, that's uh, power plants. Article 10 is power plants. So I'm not sure about power, power lines. With she bar is in our phone. I love to, three comments and three questions, but quick. <laughs> um, first, I just wanted to comment that what you said about cherry picking the, the drilling results and stuff like that is really like parallel to the way the pharmaceutical or medical industries run police by the medical industry where if an experiment doesn't have promising results, they don't even mention it and go on to the drug that's going to be the big seller. And I just think that's an interesting parallel with the government. Um, secondly, about the dot .orgs, anybody can get a dot .org. That doesn't mean they're a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I could do any website I wanted to and, and get the dot .org domain name. Um, it's different with dot .gov. You know, then you've got to be a government agency. Um, third, uh, which is the biggest issue really, and not a quick one, but I'm just going to mention it in passing and we can think about it or discuss it later, is um, I've become more and more aware of the way the government and the corporations define the terms of the debate. So we're not even talking about ecological costs, wildlife costs, damage. Um, you know, we're talking about profitability and loss and energy usage. And so much energy and time is drained from the real big issues, which is the way we're frying the planet, or well on our way to doing that. Mm -hmm. And not to, you know, the, the fact that we've got to get energy usage down drastically instead of trying to pump up more sales, we've got to destroy the capitalist model totally because that model is what's driving the increased use of energy and of resources and the destruction of the planet and you know get on to developing alternatives in, in, in a way that would make the ramp up to World War II look like a child's play. So that's something to think about later, but I think we've got to like pull ourselves out of that the, the quicksand of defining things in the government and corporation and energy industry. Now, the questions, which are quick. Uh, one, I've heard that DP depleted uranium is used in drill bits and hydrofracking. I'm wondering if that's Depleted uranium? True. Yeah. Because well, no, hard. I think what it, yeah, I think there's been a lot of hubbub about that. Uh, Halliburton has evidently some patents to use depleted uranium, uh, depleted uranium uh, in the, uh, in the uh, frack gun. When they shoot a perforation through the casing, then the idea is they could shoot um, the deple depleted uranium charges through there. When they when they open up uh, the casing to, to frack it, they use a perf gun. They basically shoot holes in the casing. And Halliburton evidently has uh, patents that contemplate using tips of you, uh, you depleted uranium bullets if you will to do. I don't. I think that's been a little bit overblown in the overall scheme of things. What's the next one? Um, secondly, uh, I've never heard any discussion of banning and of experimentation regarding drilling, and I'm wondering if that's possible. Like that, France just banned hydrofracking last week, but well, there's actually, this the Supreme Court that you of can Belgium. drive a well through that still makes experimentation. I think you have to look at, it's so easy as you were talking to get overwhelmed with how much is wrong and how much needs to be fixed. And one thing I think the industry did hound on, when they went to PA, they rolled over everybody in PA. I mean, they just took control, they paid off the politicians, they pretty much run the state. When they came into New York, I don't think they were prepared for the level of true grassroots you know, pushback. You know, they expected to come to our towns, the same as they did in PA, and have us all go, okay, anything you want, and if they threatened us, we would all roll over. And I think that was a big surprise to them. You know, and a lot of us, you know, no, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we just kind of learned as we went along. Our first meeting was in a basement over, you know, coffee and cookies to say, okay, what do we do now? You know, none of us are professional activists. You know, we're moms, we're teachers, we're nurses. We get, 
it was just community members that said, okay, let's throw our ideas together. What do we need to do? And you know, we fumbled our way through and you know, it, and decided what we had to do for our town and then gave that to other towns to use. So the point is start local. Start with your town, start with what you can do, and then expand. First, you've got to protect yourselves. We have to work on these other things. You know, climate change is huge. You know, it, and it's something that we need to work for. But if we can stop this on a local level, you know, and, and put a wrench in those works, you know, and, and keep it out of New York. You know, you know, if we're serious about climate change, serious about protecting us for our kids and not being poisoned with frack waste and abandoned wells, we have to go town by town. You know, we're pushing for a ban in the state. That's what we want. But each ban and each moratorium makes it that much harder for the industry, which is why the lawsuits right now with Dryden Middlefield supporting home rule are so important. You know, to you know, we're hoping that the courts uphold our it's traditional, our traditional rights to home rule over a corporation. Yeah, what's your question? I guess, you know, my question is about, you know, like it's it's kind of a two part thing where it's like you know, looking at, you know, how the collective resource pool is um, going towards things that, you know, if we put our collective resource pool towards the things that would be better for the benefit of the whole rather than the few, and then also interrupting the investments yeah, in, in continuing this infrastructure that would keep us going down this, this road. Um, that's, that's basically the question is that, you know, to focus on, um, you know, the ties, the, the corporate ties, um, and, you know, how the control structure is in place, uh, you know, and, like, including the audio, auto industry, all of the, you know, ways we hear our homes and things like that, you know, so just looking at, it, looking at approaching uh, the, the local law and, and state law and then, you know, on and on from that from that point. You're right, and we see a lot of student groups now on campuses looking at divestment. They right. want their colleges out of fossil fuels. Exactly. They want investment in renewals. There was a big meeting power shift down in Pennsylvania just this past weekend. And we really need the future, the young people, to take control of their future. You know, we've got to keep whittling. I mean, this has been a long time in coming. I'll be the first to admit, you know, when things are going good, you go along in your little life, you don't pay any attention to what's happening, you know, you sign a petition once in a while, save a whale, save a wolf. Yeah, but you, you really, as long as things were going okay, you didn't pay attention. And now I think people are waking up and we are paying attention as to what's been happening. You know, you know quietly, under the radar, how corporations have, you know, taken over for profit. And, and as people, we need to take that back again. It, it's not going to be short or easy. <laughs> it's 5.30. We actually are supposed to be on by 5, so we have to cut it short. But uh, Mary uh, wants to close out. Huh.